They say the 2020 campaign is a marathon, not a sprint. Unfortunately, I'm terrible at both of those kinds of foot races. It's true, very slow. Elizabeth Warren was left for dead, politically speaking, even before she officially entered the presidential race in February 2019. So back in late 2018, Warren botched an attempt to explain why she often claimed Native American heritage when she took a DNA test that suggested that she was likely somewhere between 164th and 1 1024th Native American. What do the facts say? The facts suggest that you could absolutely have a Native American ancestor in your pedigree. Tonight, the leaders of the Cherokee Nation are speaking out against Senator Elizabeth Warren's campaign video touting her Native American ancestry courtesy of a newly revealed DNA test. The tribe saying in part, quote, a DNA test is useless to determine tribal citizenship. Surprising no one, Donald Trump had some thoughts about all that. Tweeted Trump back in October 2018, quote, Pocahontas, the bad version, sometimes referred to as Elizabeth Warren, is getting slammed. She took a bogus DNA test and it showed that she may be one 1,024th, far less than the average American, end quote. Eh, Warren, once a frontrunner for the 2020 Democratic nomination, was suddenly seen as damaged goods, a candidate whose campaign ended before it ever really began. She dipped into the mid-single digits in national polls testing the 2020 field. Previously regarded as a financial juggernaut, Warren raised just $6 million in the first three months of 2019, putting her well behind not only Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris, but also behind Beto O'Rourke in the, at that point, very little known Pete Buttigieg. The political obituaries were beginning to be written for a candidate who tripped at the starting line and never really recovered. Then something changed. Actually, that's too dramatic a way to describe what happened. It wasn't any one thing. Rather, Warren just kept at it. She ignored predictions of her demise. She kept visiting early voting states like Iowa and New Hampshire. She kept building organizations in those places, and she released policy proposals. Lots and lots of policy proposals outlining what she would do if she was elected president. So according to the New York Times, Warren has released two zero, that's 20, Detailed policy plans on everything from affordable childcare to lessening the influence of lobbies in Washington to protecting public lands. Her policy ideas, broadly speaking, are aimed at addressing what Warren sees as the foundational issue of our time and the foundational issue of her campaign, the massive gap between the rich and the poor in the country. So she's proposed a new tax on families that make more than $50 million a year. Wanna hear a remarkable stat? That's about 75,000 households in the country. Whew. She's also proposed a corporate tax on massive companies like Amazon that right now pay zero taxes. I'm tired of a Washington that works for the rich and the powerful. I want a Washington that works for the rest of America. That's why I'm in this fight. The slew of proposals released by Warren go directly counter to the way presidential candidates usually do things. Traditionally, a candidate offers up one or maybe two detailed policy proposals on something that they care deeply about or something that has become a major topic of conversation in the country. On every other issue, they talk in broad terms and platitudes, promising to take a hard look at that if and when they get elected. The logic behind that strategy is relatively simple. The more detailed policy plans you release, the easier it is for your opponents, or really your opponents' opposition research teams, to pick those policies apart, finding the less appetizing elements and highlighting them to voters. Think about it. Hope and change wasn't a policy proposal. Neither was compassionate conservatism, or hell, make America great again, right? So why did Warren zig when conventional wisdom said zag? Two reasons. The first was, this is true of a lot of politics and life, pure necessity. Her campaign was at a dead stop. The only press coverage she was getting was about how she had underperformed her high expectations. So that drove a vicious cycle in which it became harder to raise money, harder to attract staff in early states, and harder to improve her standing in the polls. Vicious circle. Warren needed to do something to change the narrative about her campaign from a sinking ship to, well, literally anything else other than a sinking ship. And the second reason that Warren broke with conventional thinking was because releasing a stack of policy proposals was very, very on brand for her. Warren came to national attention in 2009 when she appeared on The Daily Show with its then host, Jon Stewart, 
to explain how the country got to this peculiar place where the gap between haves and have-nots was not only huge, but growing. We're going to make a big decision probably over about the next six months. And the big decision we're going to make is it's going to go one way or the other. We're going to decide basically, hey, we don't need regulation. You know, it's fine. Boom and bust, boom and bust, boom and bust, and good luck with your 401k. Or alternatively, we're going to say, you know, we're going to put in some smart regulation. It's going to adapt to the fact that we have new products. And what we're going to have going forward is we're going to have some stability and some real prosperity for ordinary folks. She became something of a phenomenon after that. Stewart had her on several subsequent times, and her image as a policy wonk extraordinaire was only bolstered when she was named head of the newly created Consumer Financial Protection Bureau by then President Barack Obama back in 2010. It also didn't hurt that Warren was a professor at some place called Harvard, you might have heard of it either. Now Warren's bet in the presidential race as she looked up from her low point in the spring was that after two plus years of Donald Trump as president, Democrats would respond to a nerdy college professor with an armful of detailed plans on how to change the country for the positive. Quote, you may leave here and say, oh my gosh, I must be turning into a nerd. I was applauding a government agency. How did that happen? Warren joked to a crowd in South Carolina early this year after detailing her work as the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The truth is, her bet is paying off. Warren's relentless focus on policy and her clear passion for that conversation, which is important, began to have a major impact. Polling that showed Warren in the middle of the pack in April put her in the top three and even challenging Bernie Sanders for second place in some surveys by mid-June. And that got the attention of lots of people up to and including the current resident of the White House. This from Politico speaks to that change. Quote, the Trump team, including the president himself, had been focused almost exclusively on Joe Biden to this point. But Warren's rise now has them thinking she could pose a serious threat in a general election. Warren's disciplined style, populist infused speeches, and perceived ability to win over suburban female voters, Trump advisors concede, has raised concerns. End quote. Elizabeth Warren never panicked in this race, understanding that it was a long journey and she was only at the beginning of it. And she was right. And that is the point. We make new point episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. Check them all out.